Hi, everybody, and welcome to this summer school edition of Macro Pro and Friends. I'm Diane Cohen with Macro Pro, and I'm joined with Adam Thomas from ISIS. Adam, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I am doing great. You know, we're doing this claimed summer school. Have you ever uh, gone to summer school in your, you know, growing up? I went to summer school in high school. I took health and econ 101 and how did those go oh i think he is frozen so i uh hopefully he'll come right back so i did summer school in elementary school, school. and every year that they offered health it was easy health was like the easiest class i think everyone took health for summer school. but i remember econ wait sister yeah and i i remember i got a hundred percent on like the midterm and he called me after class and said I had cheated on the exam. And so I asked him, well, did anyone else get 100%? And he said, no. So I said, so I couldn't have cheated off anyone. And he just said, all right, well, I'm going to watch you the rest of the year. And I think we had like three weeks left. And, you know, he kind of just let me be. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, even then, Adam, you were an overachiever, which is great. So um, we uh, lost you for uh, just a second. And I started telling stories. So I'll finish that real quick. Oh. So I would go to summer school. Um, and I would beg the teachers to let me go. I'm like, please let me go to summer school because I didn't need it for my, my grade. But that's where, you know, all my friends were at. And so it was like if I could go to summer school, I could do something social with other people. And, you know, I'm just a social animal. So for me, summer school was really, really yeah. important. And we're delighted to have um, Angie come speak to us. Um, today in the Claims Summer School program. So before we get started, I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do. The first thing is our uh, class is worth one CEU credit. You've got to be logged on as long as you use the link and we can see your name in the in the attendee list, you will be receiving your certificate in about two hours. It's going to say your certificate is here, please download it now. If you have issues with it, it's probably a firewall, so make sure that you contact your IT department for that. We have handouts today, so please download those so that you have them. Um, some of the handouts is the presentation that Angie is doing. In addition to that, MacroPro has a focus medical summary that we are now offering. And basically what that does is reduces the number of pages that you would send to a QME. And the really nice thing about that is you could tell us whatever body part it is and that our nurses will make sure that we summarize it based off that. And um, it's a really great pro uh, product. And then the other thing is if you have any questions, please, please put it in the question box because uh, Adam and I are gonna be monitoring those and asking the questions of Angie as they come through. And then lastly, if you wanna watch this program again, MacroPro has a YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. Now, Adam, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can introduce the uh, magnificent Angie. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, our speaker today is Angie Jung. Uh, she is a nurse case manager by background. Welcome, Angie. So if anyone has any questions uh, or comments or anything, please type them in the, the question box. Um, like Diane said, we'll, we will be watching the questions. And Angie prefers that we, we ask the questions kind of in real time. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Angie. Angie, thank you for today. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Diane, for having us and inviting us for this session. Thank you for joining us, and it's so good to be back again. Uh, so I've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to jump right into it, and hopefully, let's see what happened, because my PowerPoint went to sleep. Uh-oh. Let me keep trying. Okay, sorry about that. Let's see what happened. Um, show my screen. Okay, let's try again. Okay, I'm gonna stop share and reshare and see what happens. Sorry about that. These things happen, and you might want to try your arrow key as opposed to a mouse. I did, and that went to sleep too, and we tried that earlier, and 
let's see my apologies hmm okay let me try something There, how about now? We see Macro Pro and Friends webinar series. Huh. The webinar dashboard. Okay, because I'm seeing a different screen. Angie, we have a suggestion by the very clever Wendy. Yes. And she says, well, they have downloaded the presentation. Oh, oh actually, there, you go, might, Angie. Uh, there, there we go. go. Are we back? Yeah. Wendy had suggested we just talk uh, page numbers so they can follow along with their yeah. download. Great yeah, oh, idea, but happy but that can you, you see, Can you see my screen now or no? Yes. Can you see understanding chronic pain? Yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that, you guys. So now you should see recent statistics. Yes. Yes. Anybody? Yes, Angie, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, so um, recent statistics, just some numbers throwing it out there. Uh, about 13 to 27% adults in the US are living with chronic pain and look at the age group here and back pain is still the, the highest leading uh, disability. This is about one to five people living with chronic pain every day. And look at the direct medical costs and we certainly know this number just in the, so, you know, just in our industry, but this is pretty much general into the hundreds and billions of it, right? NCCI continues to say that even with um, one opioid prescription, the disability duration is increased by 50%. Now, with medical, look at the number and the cost and all that here on your screen here. Um, What's interesting with some, let me just show you some of this here on the screen. What's interesting is that the, uh, as crazy as our inflation in general went up, right? But interestingly, as when it comes to prescription medication, payment actually on a national average went down. 41% since 2017. And in 2023, when it comes to workers' comp, the uh, CWCI did a research and they found some really interesting figure is that the number of opioid prescription actually went down as you see on the screen here. But look at the bottom here where uh, the anti-inflammatory medications went up, okay, three folds. While this is happening, some of the medication pricing are really, really expensive. If you look at like oxycodone in 2021, um, the prescription is about 5.9% of the opioid prescription is oxycodone in 2021, okay? And that is at $145 per prescription. And I know you guys see these numbers in, um, you know, in, in your cases, but $145 per, per, per prescription, that consumes about 16% of the opioid payment. The other thing that's really scary, things like Butrin, you know, that is kind of a schedule three, uh, they, they will use sometime for detox and all that stuff. Okay, their payment's even more expensive. It's about 360 some dollars per prescription. So while the number of prescription went down, the pricing actually went up. So what we're talking about today is really to talk about chronic pain, we want to define what it is. There's some new information that I want to share with you about the definition. Uh, recognize you know, what the contributing factor to opioid use, how we could control some of the claims costs, and I really want to review the current, uh, the new stuff about the 
Narcan access rules, okay? I know that you probably have other chronic pain management um, uh, uh, sessions before by other specialists, and I'm hoping that I'm presenting you it in a different perspective from a claims and case management perspective, and that there's something um, that you'll be able to have some new information for you as well. So. In the definition of uh, pain, according to the International Association Study of Pain, okay, this the definition was updated in 2020. So basically, they're still talking about the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, okay, and that is associated with actual potential tissue damage. And you probably have heard of that before, but the unpleasant sensory we get that, right? When we cut our finger, ouch, it hurts, it's unpleasant. But when, we, when they're talking about that emotional experience, the actual tissue damage, yes, I cut my finger, actual tissue damage, it hurts. But potential tissue damage and that emotional experience, that could be very subjective, right? Because it's talking about if I think about something that hurts, it's going to hurt. Just like a little kid going to see a doctor for a for their vaccination, they see the needle. Okay, even before the before we put the needle in, the kid starts crying. Right, that's that potential tissue damage, or something maybe. Or if I'm going to tell you, you have to get a root canal done, but the dentist is out of anesthesia. Okay, or anesthetics. Okay. That emotional experience, right? That feeling that, oh my God, it's going to hurt, okay? It's also very subjective. Pain is very subjective, influenced by our makeup biologically, psychologically, and there's also social factor influence. It is encompassed of things that happen to us, what that we learn through our life as a little kid, you know, what happened when when we fell down? What do our parents do? Or what do you do for your little kids when they fall down, okay? Do you make a big deal out of it, you know, the uh, or uh, and encourage that kind of crying behavior? Or are you gonna say, hey, it's okay, no, nothing broken, it's okay, get back up, let's, you know, clean it up and let's get back on the bike. So, and also there's a cultural influence as well. Some culture, they view pain as a punishment right? Bad karma, you must have done something bad. Some culture, they believe that you should never let people know about your pain. You should never complain about it, okay? Otherwise, you would be weak. And some culture, you're supposed to be very explicit with the pain. Just let the whole world know that you have a paper cut and you're dying, okay? So a lot of things, what we learn through our experience, through our lives, you know, and that in, that encompass how we cope with pain, how we display pain, okay? It's some, and you also have to understand that just because someone may not be able to communicate the pain, that doesn't mean there's no pain. For example, someone with a brain injury, someone with a stroke, or someone with dementia, they may not be able to let you know that they're uncomfortable. They may display it differently. They may not be able to verbalize it, okay? But that uh, doesn't mean they're not in pain. The other thing is that it definitely has an adverse effect on our function, our social and psychological well-being. The important thing is, according to the International Association Study of Pain is here, Pain is whenever the person say it is, occurs when the person say it does. So remember, we're talking about the subjective factor of pain. Now, I used to believe that, honestly, I used to believe that when I was a nurse and working in a hospital, okay? But now that I see things in the case management world, I have a different perspective about this statement. Okay. I know it, it, it doesn't sound fair, but we also see in certain situations where that is difficult for us to find that believable. Okay, so when it comes to acute versus chronic pain, acute pain is normal sensation, is our protective mechanism that tells us something is wrong, that we need to do something about it. We have a toothache, 
okay? Our body is telling us something is wrong with that tooth. You need to go see a dentist. We have a stomach pain, okay? Again, those are the things that our body signals us that we need to check it out and find out what's going on, okay? So the next thing is when we deal with chronic pain, right? So chronic pain, by definition, according to all the experts in the pain management world and all that, is things that is usually lasting more than three months. Persistent pain signal, but for, you know, sometimes it lasts more than three months. It lasts years, it lasts long, long time. But here is the new thing. I don't know if you guys have seen it in your reports, have you heard about it in your industry? It's called high impact chronic pain, where the definition is, is split now on chronic pain is that with chronic pain, we're talking about people that's dealing with pain all the time, but there is no activity limitations, okay? And there's a the high impact chronic pain is when people have chronic pain that is lasting more half a day and more than three months, and there's functional impairment. There's functional limitation, whether it's with work, social, or self-care activity. And this is the group that we are dealing with most in the workers' comp industry. According to research, the high impact pain, the people involving people unable to work encompasses about 83% of that, that, that population group, okay? So one third of them can't even take care of themselves. That is a really, really high number and what we see in our industry. So to me, there's two ways of looking at chronic pain. There is that physical factor or the biological factor, okay? Because it's, first of all, we need to have an intact nervous system to feel pain. If the nervous system has some way, some kind of dysfunction, okay, to the sensation to pain, then there may be some explanation why certain people with the same kind of injury has, are in chronic pain where another person may have not have that problem. So the, another way of looking at it with pain is there's the neuropathic pain, which is associated with damages to our nervous system. Okay, whether it may be like a spinal cord injury, a herniated disc, okay, um, a brain injury, something like that, that cause the pain is caused by some kind of a nerve injury. The other kind of pain is what we call the nociceptive pain. Okay, this is caused by any kind of injury to outside of our body or to the outside part of our body or that it that stimulates the nociceptors. In our body, we, in our nervous system, we have sensate, we have receptor that's called pain receptor that are called nociceptors, okay? And so there are different, there are different kinds. For somatic pain, are pains related to tissue injury, um, skin, um, a stabbing wound, okay, that goes through the skin, go through the muscle, a broken bone, okay, those are somatic pains. Or we have visceral pain, that's the internal organs perhaps someone with a stomach ulcer, um, kidney stone, okay, a tumor, those are visceral pain. Understanding where those pains are coming from and what type of pain really help us to identify the proper medications and interventions for it, okay? So, but I said there's two parts to it. And to me, this is a more of the, um, stronger link to perhaps some of the factors associated with chronic pain, okay? The psychological factors, okay? How do this individual view that world? Remember the definition of the chronic pain that we described earlier. You know, do they see the world, you know, as the glass half full or half uh, empty, okay? How do they view that world? Uh, what's the value? What's the attitude about it? Okay, the, what about how they relate and interpret their pain? What is the environment? What's the makeup, hereditary makeup? How do they see that and how do they interpret what that means? What, was, what about what we were saying earlier? What about the cultural differences? Okay, how are the family upbringing interpret how they're supposed to behave when there's pain? their own expectations, their beliefs, and the manner that how they cope with it, how they were taught to process a painful event, okay? Um, 
and their environment. Sometimes do they somaticize that as perceived as pain? Maybe there's some other situation that's going on psychologically, their mental health, their emotional health, that also interfere with maybe their interpretation of what's going on and the pain, okay? Also, what about their history? Has there been a history of abuse? Maybe what's going on currently, not even just have to be a history, what's going on currently? What's the family situation? How are their support system? Okay. A positive or negative experience in childhood or as they're growing up as in adulthood or whatever it is, it provides a speed back to our coping mechanism, how we deal with that. Okay. So when it comes to chronic pain, remember we're talking about then the high impact things that's lasting more than three months. According to the American, American Psychiatric Association, the risk and the burden of it is the, the suicide risk, okay? The depression, the anxiety, the post-traumatic distress, okay? Um, we've all experienced pain, right? And when pain is lasting longer, longer than it's supposed to, it is very tiresome. It could certainly play to our mental health, okay? Then it may lead to our substance use disorder, okay? As well as some people, they feel like they're being stigmatized. I'm in pain, I have to take pain medication, and sometimes people will view them, them as people that are addicted to medication, even if they may not be, right, sometimes. Because think about it, in certain situations, there are those injured workers, there are those people that are always end up with certain, because of a certain injury, that they have chronic pain. Uh, I have an injured worker telling me that I really don't want to take these medication, even though he's suffering like a great deal, because I don't want people to think that I'm a drug addict, okay? I don't want my kids to see me as such. So there, that could be a um, barrier to appropriate pain management as well. We cannot talk about management of opioids without talking about the opioid epidemics. Look at the numbers here, according to the Center for Disease Control, okay? And the concern here is the drug overdose is still the leading cause of accidental death. So the leading cause of death in the US is heart disease, okay? And then, but lead, the accidental death is actually number four on the list. And the cause for that overdose, drug overdose is the leading one. So 80, 82% of people are involved with synthetic, excuse me, synthetic opioids. Opioid use disorder, 40 times higher with the risk of of opioid use. So this is the number here what we're talking about here. Most, the, the incident of people using opioid and linking it to using heroin, it's very high, okay? And then the increased death, okay? Now, the COVID situation kind of throw everything in a curveball, and it's really hard to tell how much of it is truly due to overdose, okay? But we're gonna talk about the overdose symptoms and we're gonna talk about the Narcan situation, but we cannot escape the fact that we have an epidemic going on. So you may hear a lot of people talking about opiates, opioids, narcotics, right? And you're starting to wonder, like, what's the difference? Is it the same thing? Why are people using different terms? So I'm here to clarify this for you. Opiates is that natural substance from the seed, from the poppy plant, okay? And there are not all poppy plant contains opium. There are certain kinds. So the natural substance from the opium, such as morphine, um, cocaine, um, heroin, they are all from the natural substance. Now, there may be, under opiate, there also may be some semi-synthetic opiates. Very similar structure to that natural compound, for example, like oxycodone, hydrocodone, okay, that's opiates. 
opioids is actually defined as any kind of compound that acts on our opioid receptors. Yes, our body has receptors to opioids, okay? And so that includes um, the opiates, the semi-synthetic, and fully synthetic opioids. For example, for the fully synthetic ones are the ones that's going crazy now, the fentanyls, okay, or also, and also methadone. So that's opiate. So narcotics. Narcotic is any substance that relieves pain or dull the senses. That is by definition of narcotics. It's, it's by Greek word that means to numb, to stupor. So it's, it's actually used to mean to reduce pain. But narcotics are central nervous system depressant, but it also includes things like your mushrooms, your cannabis, those are all under that narcotic umbrella, okay? So essentially, all opiates are opioids and all of these are considered as narcotics. Now, we, from a medical perspective, we shy away using the word narcotics only because that the, the DEA and are, are relating that term to people who is using illicit drugs. But essentially, it's really all the same thing. So in the clinical setting, you will see the word opioid instead versus the word narcotic, but it is still being used interchangeably um, and the effect are the same, okay? But look at the bottom here about synthetic opioids. For example, I just wanted to give you this fentanyl, okay? Look at the potential the potency compared to morphine and heroin. That's why the fentanyl is so scary, okay? And also that it's, it's so easy to reproduce, it's so cheap to reproduce because they get the material from either China or Mexico and when, they, when people illegally reproducing this um, and selling it and that's where it creates a problem. But I'm telling you, Fentanyl in itself, when it's used appropriately, and that was what the initial intent of purpose is for, is a good drug. All right. So how does it really work in our body? What happens when we take an opioid? Okay. So opioid is kind of like that lock and key theory. Okay. Our endogenous, our, our own body's opioid receptors. Okay, that is found in abundance in our nervous central system, in our brain, in our spinal cord, okay? And so what happened is when we take this, the, the opioid okay, stimulates the, that, that lock and key theories and it interacts with the brain receptor. And so it triggers the release of endorphin, okay? So, it mimics the function of our endogenous endorphin. We have endorphins in our body. Endorphins are molecules that helps to reduce pain sensation, therefore relieving pain. So when you take an opioid, okay, it stimulates that to multiple times, okay, many, many more times more potent than our own endorphin. But it also, what we said earlier, is a central nervous system depressant, okay? Because it slows down everything. It hits our limbic system, which controls our emotion. That's our emotional part of the brain. But that is the part that creates our pleasure, our happiness, our relaxation, our euphoria. It hits that system. It hits the brainstem, which controls our autonomic system, our breathing, okay, our um, heart, our blood pressure. That's where it controls. So it's a central nervous system depressant means it slows everything down. It's just intended for to relax you. It also hits the spinal cord, which controls that pain signal that going to letting the brain know you're in pain. All right, so 
basically it targets the two main reward system in our body the dopamine and the endorphins okay so the endorphins like i said is the re pain we reduce our pain the dopamine is our pleasure sense uh, the pleasure sense uh, chem uh system uh substance in our body okay so if you want to increase dopamine do things that make you happy eating chocolate you could still increase your dopamine that way all right so this is what happens sometimes when we're concerned with people that are ticking or depending on the medication opioids are divided into what we call scheduled drugs and they're scheduled by the potency of uh, the tendency of people getting addicted to it. So starting with the weakest one, which you see here on the screen, are also considered as opioids, okay? But they are in a schedule four, which has weaker narcotics or opioids because it has less tendency for um, uh, overuse. Schedule three, okay, still less potent for addiction, but it's there. And all these drugs here are your schedule three your ketamine, your subuzone, subutex, and sometimes we use these for detox, which works really, really well, okay? Um, codeine is another one. Schedule two are the ones that we are concerned about, that we have to deal with. Look at the all this here that you see on schedule two, and how many of those are what our injured workers are taking, right? Cocaine is under schedule two, opium, methamphetamines, Adderall, Redolin, okay? It, these are all under Schedule II drugs. And then your Schedule I are all the ones that's illegal drugs. They're only approved for research purpose. On the same cannabis is, is illegal. It's still from the federal level. It's a Schedule I drug. Um, even though in California, uh, we accept medical and recreational uh, marijuana under federal regulation, it's still a Schedule I drug. Schedule I drugs cannot be prescribed cannot be used for medicinal purposes, and that's where it's standing right now. Okay, so when it comes to opioid misuse and dependency, I wanna let you know that the word I'm changing here is the word abuse, okay? So what like um, detox centers and mental health um, organization that work with people that are have substance use disorder, they really do not want to use the word abuse because it is it's a really negative connotation to it. And there are certain reasons that some people may be depending on these medications for whatever reason it is, okay? So the word is opioid misuse, misuse uh, or dependence. Um, unless it's diagnosed, we cannot use opioid substance use disorder unless it's diagnosed by a specialist. So some of the contributing factors, you know, it's still, it's better, I have to say, we are doing a better job, but it's still pretty easy to get these medications, okay? My husband had a minor procedure, literally, really minor procedure, and the doctor prescribed him, you know, feel Vicodin. I'm saying, no, I don't need it. He doesn't need it. We could take the anti-inflammatory, right? I'm saying this. We could take the anti-inflammatory. It's no big deal, but he insists that he have a prescription for a few Vicodin. Okay, polypharmacy, multiple prescribers, yes, sometimes that happen where the doctors are not talking to each other, it's very easy. But nowadays, if everybody is following through the system, there's the CURES, C-U-E-R-S, CURES system, where anybody that is a prescriber, doctors, um, PAs, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, they are supposed to sign up to this national database so that before they prescribe someone an opioid, they're supposed to check if this individual ever received or on any other opioid prescriptions. So this is only as good as they are doing this, okay? So there, we still could run into problem where they're uh, doctor shopping, seeing different doctors, getting the medications, and we hear this in the news all the time, where other, there are other prescribers that are doing it regardless what they're doing to the individual, and uh, so they're prescribing them. Inappropriate prescription, lack of monitoring by the doctor, okay? Inadequate training, right? So 
Most of the time we get this doctor prescribing it either through Ahmed, through our orthopedic doctor. They don't know much about opioids. They don't know much about pain management. And this is how sometimes we end up getting in trouble and they don't monitor it. Okay, they don't monitor how long they've been taking it, if they've been taking other medications. They never ask if they've uh, been taking, you know, if they have an addict addictive personality of anything. Um, so these are some that should have been in place. Okay, sometimes, sometimes we have to consider, okay, that if an injured worker continues to complaining of pain, that did we get the correct diagnosis? Because if we didn't fix something correctly, then it makes sense that this individual continue to experience pain, okay? Um, lack of emphasis on screening, education, and prevention. When I'm at the doctor's office, rarely do I hear the doctor asking, one time, I only heard that one time, telling the injured worker what they're prescribing, what the risks are with this medication, and if they had an addiction with anything. Typically what I hear is, you're in pain? Here, I'm gonna give you a medication for your pain. Scribble something on a pad, and they have no idea what it is, okay? Injured worker usually not gonna ask um, about it. And this is something that we really need to educate and emphasize a lot more, okay? The one time that I had a doctor asking this person about a history of addiction, was so um, it was so prevalent because this person had a severe injury to an upper extremity, um, tissue, muscle, nerve damage, and after he recovered from the acute hospital, transferred care to another doctor that's going to take over for the workers' comp, and was a pain management doctor, um, and that was the first thing that one of the, that doctor asked him. Do you have an addiction to anything? And the injured worker said, yes, I do. Now, obviously, at the time of injury, when he was um, in acute, he had received the opioids and multiple of it, right? Okay, so now that we understand this, the important thing is to gradually wean him off of these opioid and substitute it with other medications, okay? So that was very, very effective. So fraud prevention framework for controlled substances. We've been screaming this for a long, long time. Finally, people are doing some things about it, right? We're doing better, uh, but we need to continue to work on that. There's also the social value and the psychological impact when it can contribute to chronic pain that what we had talked about earlier. And there's also another component when it comes to work injury is that the injured worker is angry. They got hurt at work, okay? They, you're supposed to make me whole. I wasn't in pain before, and so now I'm in pain. They're angry. They're gonna go to, towards that pain medication, whatever it is, okay? Um, the physical and the psychological dependence, okay? Part of it is the, the drug. Part of it is the individual's genetic makeup. There's definitely a difference though. The physical dependence, it's, it's like they need that drug to function, okay? If they discontinue it, they would go into, um, oh God, I just lost my word. Um, well, anyway, it'll come back, it'll come back. The psychological dependence is, when they really don't need that medication, but they feel that if they don't take it, they might be in pain. So they will take that drug around the clock, okay? So um, I had an injured worker that I told her that, you know, you these medications are not working for you. We, we should need to talk to the doctor to maybe change it, maybe go through a detox program. And she literally told me, don't do it. I can't discontinue these drugs because I'm afraid that if I reduce it, if I stop it, I will feel the pain, okay? She wouldn't even give it a try. When it comes to using opioids, there's really four things that we need to keep in mind. And the important thing is the ongoing monitoring of, did that medication help to relieve the pain? 
or provide good pain control? Was it effective? The other thing is looking at, did it improve the daily activities? Because if this is something that works, if this drug is supposed to work, then this person should be more functional, okay? Need to watch out for any kind of adverse side effects and any kind of aberrant drug behavior. Increasing use of dosage, um, asking, uh, using meds on purpose other than what is prescribed, maybe hoarding the medication, to, um, um, you know, any kind of that kind of behavior. Okay, so if you talk to some experts in pain management, use of opioids is not always a bad thing because there are certain conditions that requires it people in that people have cancer, okay? Um, people in our situation in a workers' comp were people with spinal cord injuries, okay? People with nerve injuries, those kind of pain will not go away. So, but just because someone is on opioid, that does not always mean that they have a substance use disorder. I have injured workers that are on this it's going to take this, you know, they're going to need this for life, but has very good control of when to take it. There's no aberrant behavior, okay? Does, they don't escalate the prescription. Um, in fact, sometimes they even don't need to refill it because they are watching, they're monitoring it and doing a really good job of it, okay? Versus other injured workers that we, many of us work with that have all this out of control and that's when it becomes dangerous. I'm just going to go over the, you know, in fortunately in workers comp, we've had so we have so many of these safeguard guidelines that we've been practicing for such a long time before nationally these people are talking about some of these guidelines, right? Now, Center for Disease Control have uh, probably a couple of these uh, opioid prescription guidelines. This is the most recent one. There's really a total of 12 recommended statements. If you want to look at that, there's a link um, on your screen and in your handout as well. But I'm just going to cover you know, some of just a few, for example. You, first, we really want to start with things that are non-opioid, okay, or even non-pharmacological treatment. Okay, so for management of pain. Establish a treatment plan. Before we even go use uh, prescribing opioid, have we try other medications first, other kind of therapy first, okay? What is the treatment plan? Is that, that what is the reasons for the pain? Um, there's uh, some doctors ask for a contract. Okay, this is also recommended by ACOM, is a pain management doctor should have the injured worker sign a contract when it comes to opioid. When are we going to reduce this? How are we monitoring it? And when are we going to reduce the medication? When are we going to discontinue it? Those kind of contracts, okay? Need to determine the need for the opioid. Is it what kind of pain it is? Intermittent, short-acting, long-acting medications? Um, initiate that uh, the lowest dose first if we are going to have to use opioid. There is a ladder that we're talking about, the paint, the, the uh, prescription ladder. Start with the lowest first, okay, before you go up to the level that is most appropriate. Now, you have to take in, keep in mind that if it's an acute injury, we are not going to start with the lowest first. If someone sever the arm, okay, have a fracture, we are going to go with the highest that is most effective before we wean them down. Okay, so ongoing monitoring, ongoing management. We have to determine when we should discontinue use of opioid. We don't keep prescribing, prescribing without asking them, okay? And we went to continue, when to discontinue it. Oh, sorry, let me get back here. So back then, earlier I was saying how the doctors are not trained. Thank goodness this happened. Look at this, effective of last month this year. Okay, doctors need to complete eight hours of training in management and treating opioids and other substance use disorder. Yeah, that's finally happening. So ACOM, again, I'm not going to go through too much of it. We already know 
what it is with ECOM monitoring and using uh, drug screening and urine screening. It really doesn't need to be every visit your urine random drug screen, your urine test, okay? If they are all compliant, they don't need to do it every time, but I know some doctor's office, they do it every time and they bill you for it, okay? Consider about drug rotation sometime. I wanna get back here about the maximum dosage of morphine equivalent, okay? Morphine is the gold standard that we use in a clinical setting for optimum dosage of opioids. No more than 50 milligram per day is what the ACOM guideline is saying. Other guidelines could be higher, but that's what we're talking about. And so mo all opioids has a um, um, translation kind of a table to determine their dosage. So for example, Norco, okay, Norco is really easy uh, to translate because Norco, one milligram of Norco equals one milligram of morphine. So, so if someone is taking Norco 10, 325, okay, the 10 milligram is the Norco, the 325 is the Tylenol, okay? So let's say someone is taking a Norco 10 every four hours around the clock. This person is taking at least six pills, let's say six pills a day. That is 60 milligrams of morphine and they're taking too much. Okay, that's what it means. All right. So avoid concurrent benzo uh, benzodiazepine anti-inflammatories with opioid. Okay, these are examples of what benzos are that a lot of our injured workers are also taking. The things like the Xanax, the Valiums, the Ativans, okay, all that stuff. The risk of it is increases respiratory inf uh, of depression when they take it with opioid. It also increases the risk of suicide and other side effects. Also, what it helps us is our uh, DWC, the MTUS pain management guideline. Again, not going to talk too much about it because there's, we are familiar with it and there's certain things that you are approves and not approves. Um, Definitely, it, they are not going to approve anything like a Schedule II for sprain and strain injuries um, or things about the, uh, the uh, intrathecal drug delivery system. There's 126 pages, and we now also have a drug formulary. Okay, so as far as claims management, really to look at those cases with red flag because there are some injuries with higher potential for chronic pain. So, like I said earlier, that not we have to look at that there are some cases, okay, like nerve injuries, trauma, multiple surgeries, that they are going to end up with some kind of chronic pain. We want to be sure, certain that there's no other patho pathological, uh, pathophysiological causes. Did we get the correct diagnosis? Did we treat the condition appropriately? Did we miss something? Maybe we should have a second opinion. Identify those risk factors. You're the best person when you talk to the injured workers, when you look at those records to determine. Those takes time. It's not a one-time conversation, okay? But are there something that we need to be concerned about? Are there pre-existing the psychosocial factors that we're talking about, okay? Are there codependence? Are there history of drug problems? Are there secondary gains, okay? Because sometimes you have to think that if pain and all this manage and, and all these interventions are not resolved. What could there be? Okay. Um, for example, a fracture bone. Okay, that heal. I mean, we could identify pretty quickly, and it usually heals up re relatively well. Um, but then pain persists. We have to determine what it is. Do we need to do an MRI? Do we need to evaluate what is going on with the family situations? Um, and then monitoring, utilizing the resources and the tools that you have, your UR, your pharmacy management system, your peer review and all that. Education, it is so important that we need to do a better job. If the doctor doesn't educate them, for you as a claims manager, you need to educate the injured worker, not about the, not about, you know, about the drug itself, that it's not your responsibility, but at least talk to, when you talk to them, mention, you know, I noticed that the, the doctor prescribed the Snorkos or Vicodin, whatever it is for you. Did the doctor talk to you about these drugs? 
um, and what they're for and you know what are the risks of taking some of these medications. If they say no, he never told me about it, Next time at the doctor's office, talk, ask your doctor to explain it to you, you know, something like that to kind of at least, you know, get their mind going. When you have a case manager, this is where the case manager could be involved during the doctor's appointment visit to get the doctor involved to talk more about these drugs, okay? Um, um, what else I was going to say? Let's see here. Talking to the doctor, okay, maybe... See if you could talk to the doctor directly about, you know, changing the medication, reducing the medications. Um, so there are times when the doctor doesn't understand the, why you have to request refills in a certain way and a certain dosage and why they always get denied by UR. Maybe because their requests for these refills of these medications are outside of the ACOM guideline. Even if you are sent a letter to them, you know, 80, 90% of the time, they don't read those UR letters. They're not the one who read those UR letters, and they don't understand the reason for the denial of the medication refill. So sometimes you may need to make that phone call, or sometimes you may want to get somebody in there, get case management, get a specialist, or whatever it is, to be in there to explain that to the doctor. It works. It works really well. And sometimes, if, hey, if it doesn't go well, yeah, you know, whatever it is, you may need to consider transfer of care. Just because they're with the pain management specialist, that doesn't mean that specialist is appropriate for that injured worker. So you understand what I'm saying. So we talk about the random urine test. Okay, considered early pain management and detox if that is necessary, but you know that it can be very, very expensive. Engage safe, uh, stay at work or early return to work as much as possible if they could accommodate it. You know, consider what is going on in the family as well. Um, I have I have one injured worker that tells me, you know, Angie, I have never had my husband and my kids pay as much attention to me as they have now that I am in pain. My husband takes care of me. My kids do their chores. They, they clean up the house. They pay attention to me. This gives me a red flag that this is a secondary gain situation here, okay? So let's take a few minutes to talk about the naloxone access rule. This is pertaining to California that I'm covering, but actually, all 50 states, including District Columbia, Puerto Rico, have some form of lenoxone access rules, okay? It just depends on the jurisdiction and how to obtain it and uh, what are some of the guidelines. Okay, so in 2024, this has been something that's been going on for a while. It really does allow that family and friends, the people who know that they have prescription for opioid, that they could receive the nonoxone. And I'm gonna just say Narcan, okay? Narcan, so really what is it, right? Narcan is an opioid antagonist. So remember that lock and key theory, okay? So what Narcan does is it attaches itself to those opioid receptors, and it blocks the opioids from getting in. So, so it, and it reverses the effect of the opioid, okay? So, in 2018, we have the standing order, okay, for the community. This one is for the community organization and other state entity to receive and distribute Narcan. The other thing is individual that receive these Narcan they may administer it, okay? But the rule is that they have to go through certain training. Now, that's the standing order. And the purpose of it is to reduce the morbidity and the um, mortality associated with it, right? So with the standing order, okay, what they have to do is they have, anybody that wants to have Narcan at the facility, Remember, there's only certain group of people that is eligible and qualified. They have to apply for it. Not everybody could get that kind of um, distribution and status. So if they receive approval for it, they could have it in the facility and they could administer it, okay? So for California, they must apply to the California Department of Public Health. Um, 
and apply um, through the, and that's only to be approved to have access, to gain access or to receive and distribute Narcan. But they also have to go through the California Department of Healthcare Services to receive the Narcan, okay, and to administer it. Um, so some of the school, some of the entities include like schools, of course, um, like the, the first responders, um, the jail, okay, things that people that work in the state level or that work with public that are maybe the unhoused or people that have substance use housing, all those kind of organization, they could apply for this. So. California also have what we call prescriber and dispenser immunity, kind of fall into the guideline of that Good Samaritan. Prescriber who acts, okay, with reasonable care will not be subject to um, any, any civil uh, liability or any criminal prosecution, okay? Dispenser immunity also is people who dispense it are also protected in an event that you know they dis, uh, they use uh, Narcan on somebody that they are protected as well and not subject to criminal prosecution. Okay, so here are some of the places that they, who could dispense it. Okay, so again, must apply, must go through training. Um, there are some free to the, the Narcans are free to all these entities that is um, right above it, okay? They, they, there are minimum order, and leave, even though that you use Narcan, you still need to call 911, okay? The reason is that Narcan, whether it's the nasal spray, actually Narcan could come in nasal spray, IM, sub-Q, and IV. What's available to public is the nasal spray. It works really fast. It takes effect in about like three minutes, but it wears off in about 30 minutes to about 90 minutes. Um, so you could reuse it again. Now for someone, because we don't know how much that individual has taken the opioid. Oh, we know if you they recognize that they are non-responsive, okay, then you could use the Narcan on them, okay? But you gotta call because you don't know how much, you gotta call 911 because you don't know they could go back into the uh, sedation again. But you could use it again, but um, uh, they need to be evaluated. Okay, so there's no statutory limitation on what the age limit of using it. If, hey, if kid accidentally got hold of some kind of opioid, right? As we hear so many times in the news, and this is why they're now wanting the schools to have all this, okay? So there's no statutory limit who could use it. And now it's going to be available over the counter, okay? Four milligram, this is kind of the standard one, uh, the dosage on the nasal spray is four milligram, okay? So it's gonna be available over the counter, it's just depending when the pharmacy is going to get them and there's apparently my understanding is there's some shortage of it it's covered by insurance medicare part d medicaid medical okay when it comes to workers comp it is recommended people that is taking more than 50 milligram uh, equivalent okay people with um, opioid use disorder people that's taking benzo together they need to learn the signs of overdose that was the word i forgot <laughs> okay the overdose signs of overdose okay what are some of those signs of overdose that they need to recognize okay the constricted pupil pinpoint pupil because it's a depressant okay they are not responsive they're slow they are cold they're discolored okay the shallow breathing those are concerns of overdose okay educate about storage and proposal Okay, so some people may ask, what if I give Lenoxin to someone who does not, who I thought they overdosed, but it's not, okay? It's not going to hurt them. Narcan is relatively safe, and, and mo they have not found any evidence that it was given to them in other conditions that um, they, there's any problem. Okay, now keep in mind, Narcan only works on opioids. Okay, not any other substance, not if they OD on marijuana or cocaine or meth or anything like that, but 
it doesn't matter. You could still give them Narcan because a lot of times these are, these drugs are mixed with opioids. Okay. So the employer may ask questions about, can I have it in the workplace? If they meet those qualifications and, um, you know, there's covered by the California Good Samaritan law, but the employer needs to think, you may have employer that work with the, like the city, okay, or a public agency that they, they might say, you know, how, where should I have it? Can I have it? What do I do with it? And all that stuff. They may ask you uh, because that actually came across to our desk as well. Can you guys train us how to use it? Okay. So no, we cannot because it has to go through the department. So you first have to determine, is there a staff that's willing to be trained and administer the, uh, the Narcan? Okay. Um, maybe if they have staff that's already trained in first aid, maybe they are willing to do it. Okay. Are there facility, are there people that might walk in at the facility that may have an opioid event in the workplace? That might be something that they would be considered. Maybe they work with public. Okay. Maybe they have visitor that might come in with that. Right. And then you have to determine how quickly, how close are they with the emergency response. And the company that wants to do that, once they meet the requirement, they still have to establish a policy and procedure. So here are some links to some of these rules. I want to show you how it looks like, the nasal spray and then the injection. What is in the middle here is the auto injector is no longer available by the FDA. So just wrapping up, sorry, I ran a little bit over time. When it comes to chronic pain management, it must be individualized. There's really no one single approach. If we can minimize the use of opioid on the onset and kind of talk to the doctor about it and look at the four A's that we're talking about if they are on opioid. And then really, really it's just important working through with the doctors and increasing public awareness. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry I went over time. There's a lot of information I want to cover. Are there any questions? Angie, I did not see any questions. Adam, did you see any? I don't know if Adam's camera is working. He seems to be off screen now. Angie, I want to thank you so very much for this great presentation. You always give us so much information that is so useful. Can you tell us a little bit about what uh, your company provides? What services? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Um, ISIS is a case management company, uh, an independent case oh. management company. Look at the, uh, we celebrating our 25th year uh, of business and we cover throughout California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, and New Mexico. Um, and so, that's what we do. We also provide education. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You do a lot of it with us. So we really appreciate the partnership and the information you bring. So I just want to remind everybody there is a flyer that's attached um, regarding our injury focused summaries that will help you with uh, going through the medical records and making sure that you have everything you need. It's really a great product. You know, Angie's people are working really hard. They provide you great information. And this is a way that our nurses can help just kind of condense all that so that you send just the right number of pages to the QME. And this is the back to school webinar series. We do have some upcoming webinars. So I just want to remind you that um, our next webinar is going to be identifying high exposure claims. Then we'll have a uh, Medicare mid-year review. And then we have a kind of really interesting uh, program. They're all interesting, but I really like this one. So um, TD overpayments, you know, how to administer it, how to administer them, how to recoup your costs, and then how to prevent them at all from happening. That's always a very nice thing, right? And then we have a three-part series on mental health for, op for officers, and it's going to go into why some calls are more mentally taxing for uh, our police officers the importance of the leadership in the department, and then lastly, getting the right mental health treatment for police. So if you handle any type of police claims, you are definitely going to want to watch that. All those things can be found on the MacroPro website. You know how to register because you're here with us today. And we want to thank you again, Angie, for joining us, and we will see you at the next MacroPro and Friends, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye-bye now. And thanks, Adam. I'm sorry your camera didn't work. Yep, thank you guys.